Assalamu alaikum and uh, welcome everyone to another episode of Danish TV's English language TV channel, the global voice of the Center for Muslim World Studies. And uh, tonight is a very special night, uh, tonight here in Pakistan and, uh, and other places, evenings, mornings, afternoons, and so on, because we have with us uh, Professor Joseph Massad, uh, uh, a dear friend, and beyond that, uh, simply one of the most innovative, dynamic uh, thinkers we have today in the world. I think that uh, I don't want to... Uh, to start to go into uh, my typical exaggeration, but in, in this case, there is no exaggeration. Um, if I uh, really wanted to do something, I would start to rank him <laughs> as one of the, the, these top intellectuals, but we'll put that aside because that may embarrass uh, uh, Brother Joseph Massad uh, too much. He's a professor at uh, Columbia University of Arab Politics, Intellectual History, and uh, uh, well-known books, uh, Desiring Arabs, and his uh, most recent one, one of my favorites, uh, Islam in Liberalism. And uh, we are going to try to cover uh, a couple of topics that he touches upon in his works, um, and not only in his uh, monumental uh, books, but uh, in his uh, scathingly sharp and uh, incredibly incisive uh, articles and pieces that he he writes uh, uh, so prolifically, and uh, uh, it is really an honor and delight for us to have you, Professor Joseph Massad. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me and for this exceedingly generous introduction. Yeah, it could go longer, but I, just for the sake of time, I will uh, uh, spare. But um, so, uh, Brother Joseph Masal, we were going to touch on uh, three three topics uh, here, and I'll just lay them out at the beginning, and then we can go through them. But we, uh, we, I wanted to go through first what has transpired, uh, the larger context of the post Cold War framework, and what has happened to, in some ways, broadly speaking, politics, uh, and what has. Uh, uh, the, the larger process of kind of depoliticization and so on. So that's one thing we, uh, we want to speak about. Another thing very pertinent and relevant right uh, at, at the present moment, but of course the phenomena we have been witnessing for a while, and that is the uh, intensification uh, and the resurgence of uh, Islamophobia uh, throughout the Western plutocracies, but especially as we've recently seen it in France. And finally, uh, a topic very near and dear to our hearts. Uh, that's the question of, uh, of Palestine. Uh, another wonderful work by uh, Professor Joseph Massad, the, the persistence of the Palestinian question. And not only the question of uh, Palestine, but in the context of the treacherous behavior of some of the regimes uh, in the region and the, the types of pressure they're putting on our poor regime here in Pakistan. So uh, these are some of the topics that I want to touch upon. But going to the first uh, in terms of the post-Cold War context, as a prelude to that, uh, in some ways, we must first recognize the tradition before that, uh, the, the, the tradition of decolonization, the anti-colonial sentiments that existed through, throughout uh, the, the, the colonized world, and what type of uh, th uh, thought process, what type of praxis did that produce, and how in some ways, uh, after the demise of the Soviet Union and this post-Cold War context, what were the dramatic differences uh, that then emerged uh, from that older, very anti-colonial militant tradition to what uh, we can call what uh, uh, Professor Joseph Massad uh, has termed the NGOization? So I, I was wondering, Professor Massad, if you can give some reflections on, on this topic, uh, first of all. Um, uh, indeed, I, I think perhaps um, uh, speaking about the beginning of the Cold War would be a good prelude to explaining what happened at the end of the war. So what you have, of course, um, uh, was by the late 1940s, early 1950s, 
Uh, the U.S. is very concerned about all these revolutionary decolonizing movements um, around the world. And as these movements um, uh, are looking for examples that they might, or, or allies to ally themselves with, they find, of course, that the U.S. at the time being a white supremacist, apartheid regime, segregationist, um, uh, under the Jim Crow laws, um, indeed even the continued oppression and confiscation of lands of Native Americans who for the first time uh, were allowed to vote around 1948 despite all kinds of institutional obstacles in their way. As a result, of course, these many countries who were, had just rid themselves of European colonialism and racism did not look favorably on the U.S. example. Um, mm -hmm. as it presented itself. The Soviet Union presented a better example for them, um, which of course mm -hmm. uh, horrified the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a result, of course, uh, uh, the pressure of decolonizing regimes and revolutionary movements was such that the US began to desegregate um, its own institutional mm -hmm. structure in the US in the 1954. You have a major legal case of uh, Brown versus the Board of Education, to desegregate uh, racially American schools. And of course, this was uh, 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 there was an ongoing African-American struggle against mm -hmm. this uh, uh, racism, which goes back, of course, to the beginning of the establishment of the United States. So between the internal mm -hmm. struggle and the continuation of that struggle and the external foreign policy objectives of the US, you begin to see a certain change within the US in order to uh, present itself as a viable example for decolonizing countries. Nonetheless, of course, the, much of the intellectual and political trends across the third world were uh, revolutionary, um, mostly socialist, uh, liberationist, and anti-colonial. Um, this situation, of course, was of much concern to uh, the Americans. We know, for example, that the CIA had an important program of cultural propaganda, um, uh, right. especially in the 1960s, but 50s and 60s onwards, in order to sway many of these intellectuals through funding of publications, uh, funding of newspapers and magazines and book projects, including translation, uh, um, publishing houses. The idea was, of course, to spread an American anti-socialist message Right. and an anti-Soviet message um, inside these publications. The success rate was low. The U.S. was unable to influence the bulk of the intellectuals of the third world of decolonizing regimes until, of course, um, the 1980s. Uh, the 1980s, mm. were, you know, is the beginning of the neoliberalization. I mean, it begins in the 70s, but the spread of neoliberalization around the world, which begins in the late 70s, now is institutionalized in the 80s with the arrival of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. Um, and, of course, uh, the decision was made that uh, the Soviets had to be gone, basically. That right. More more pressure in terms of the arms race in space and elsewhere has to be put on the Soviets who would not be able to afford it and therefore bring about their collapse so that finally the U.S. would not have a competitor. Indeed, right. this is exactly what happened by the early 90s, but already you feel the change since the mid-1980s after right. the arrival of Gorbachev and uh, uh, the U.S. decides to transform a lot of these grassroots organizations mm. that many of the third world decolonizing socialist countries uh, or even uh, 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 more conservative countries have also invested in, sort of in terms yes. of women's groups, health groups, um, right. uh, labor groups. All of those, of course, had been grassroots. Um, they had to be transformed into something else in many ways, um, so that the U.S. can control uh, the kinds of politics that they would propagate. While a lot of these organizations, these early grassroots NGOs from the 60s and 70s, and mass organizations now lost a lot of uh, uh, their funding as a result of the slow disappearance of the welfare state as a result of neoliberalism and the disappearance of the Soviet Union, they begin to be replaced by American and European Union funded uh, non-governmental organizations, as well as private, privately, not only both governmental and private uh, foundations, mm -hmm. Ford Foundation, Carnegie Mellon, all of these organizations who were, especially Ford, was instrumental in helping U.S. imperialism mm. during the Cold War, becomes the major funder for a large uh, array of causes um, around the Third World. Um, 
including right. including new research centers. You see, uh, the new yes. terms begin begin to be democracy, uh, freedom of speech, and and, and uh, political uh, expression, uh, rather than uh, so. The idea is that. Uh, we should forget about economic rights, we should forget about right. democracy, and we should put forth a kind of semblance of what the U.S. calls political democracy. So all economic issues were basically uh, shunned aside, and um, uh, sort of the uh, what emerged in the U.S. in the 1970s uh, as identity politics now begins right. to be um, uh, disseminated across these NGOs around the third world. Suddenly, uh, activists who had worked for decades uh, right. to bring about equal rights for women uh, were told, "Why don't you work for our NGOs? You know, we also support right. women's rights, and we'll give you, you know, four or five thousand dollars a month as a salary, right. for your own NGO car with a driver and what have you." Um, right. So between you know the late eighties and the late nineties, you have a large number of intellectuals and act grassroots activists had been co-opted into these NGOs without feeling initially that they had sold out their um, commit political commitments, whether to defend women's rights or to defend children's rights or for. Um, the uh, making available of health services to the poor or things of that sort. But of course, um, they realized uh, very, very quickly that they do not make policy anymore. The policy is made elsewhere. Um, mm -hmm. and initially, you begin to have a lot of white Europeans and Americans running the local chapters of these NGOs. But then very, very quickly, the US um, realize that uh, the, the white decision makers can remain at the headquarters in Europe and in the US. Right. And now you can actually bring in all the upper middle class um, former activists who speak right. with the European languages to preside over local NGOs. Um, Egypt would perhaps be the first economy in the third world to be transformed into a neoliberal economy after 1997. Under Anwar Sadat's rule, uh, New York City locally would be one of those uh, places. Uh, the pressure placed on uh, communist Poland in the yeah. late 70s and early 80s, another example. But soon all of this would be basically a, a small uh, uh, change compared to the larger structural transformation of uh, places around the third world from uh, occupied Palestine to Egypt to Jordan and the Middle East to India and Pakistan and Bangladesh yes. to, uh, across the third world more generally. Uh, the NGOs now have been able to co-opt most of the formerly anti-colonial uh, right socialist activists who suddenly overnight became liberal activists for political rights and no longer mentioning economic rights, presumably except their own in terms of negotiating good salaries and a good package. Um, but, right. beyond that, but beyond that, the question of economic rights uh, was, uh, again, shoved aside in favor of, uh, you know, sort of liberal definitions of political rights. No, you're absolutely right, uh, Professor Massad. I mean, h here in Pakistan, uh, we know this uh, all too well. I mean, the term even NGO by, by by this stage, I mean, it has almost become like a four-letter word that, that people don't want to associate. Although, of course, the, the, we have a class of intelligentsia that that's the way to, to go. And this this whole era that you're describing, uh, it, it, it seems like... Um, it was a very deliberate project of depoliticizing uh, the the old mass movements and getting these kind of the old progressive uh, anti-colonial intellectuals and and activists into a project in which the way to transformation to uh, to to revolution is start an NGO or become part of an NGO and that'll solve all the problems. Whereas the, all the issues that you mentioned, doesn't matter whether the state uh, is now washing its hands away from uh, taking care of the population, and not all the IMF world bank restructuring of the economies, that's, that we don't speak about. But it's, uh, we just open up an NGO from nine to five, 
and hopefully that will bring about the revolution. I mean, in some ways, this is... This no, no, is, no, no revolution necessary. The, the no, yeah, no, revolution is no longer necessary. In fact, that is, you know, that is a passe. And in fact, that was that will be more bloody and violent and cause more problems that we have. I mean, this is the kind of uh, ideology that's, exactly. that was, that was, that's being well, accused. Only a liberal, a liberal horizon of political rights would ensure right. freedom while we don't have to worry about the economy. Right, right, absolutely, absolutely. And, so and let's just... well, one of the interesting things about neoliberalism is that while neoliberalism always speaks about the contraction of the state, for example, the World yeah. Bank and the IMF and the US would insist in the restructuring of the local economy that the state is very wasteful, it has to actually bring down its expenditures by yeah. contracting its services. However, of course, as all the social services get contracted and, you know, by, by the state, um, one uh, arena gets constantly expanding and the IMF and the World Bank don't object to it, namely the military and the police. Right. Right. So the, right. arms of the, the policing uh, uh, and the military arms of the state continue to expand and there's no objection about the amount of money that is taken away from social services to be pumped into uh, the army and the local police mm -hmm. and other repressive apparatuses, because of course they are now needed as poverty right. become more and more uh, uh, prevalent and people will of course uh, be more likely to demonstrate or revolt necessitating yes. the repressive arm of the state. So again, when they speak about the contraction of the state, yep. what they mean is only the social services and they That's forget right. to mention the major expansion of the repressive apparatuses of the state needed for the for social control of the large swaths of the population that will be impoverished by this entire process yeah, so it, it, it uh, would be we, in the united states of course i mean let, let us remember yeah, uh, absolutely President obama militarized the police force in the u.s in anticipation that his neoliberal policies which continued the neoliberal policies of reagan and uh, uh, bush and clinton uh were, were bringing about more poverty and therefore you would walk in new york city and find policemen with submachine guns for the first time ever right um, so you know and, and this is in the us where there are still some legal frameworks to defend uh, right. uh, the civil is, rights this is, of the population this is exactly this is so supposedly in the zone of being. <laughs> Even this is happening in the zone of being. But and you can imagine what's happening in the zone of non-being. Uh, but but we would often joke about how many of these NGOs would want uh, would not care as you were uh, as you were saying had were completely indifferent to the social economic uh, issues of the of the day, and so they would uh, want to make a. A, a, a conservative a poor person, a more liberal poor, poor, poor person. <laughs> That's pretty much it. And and even that, the agenda of that, uh, you know, was, was suspect as well, you know? I, I should say that some of the more radical amongst them are interested in mitigating the horrific yeah. effects of neoliberalism, but yeah. only in mitigating that. They don't think there's anything wrong with neoliberalism, except that it has certain you know, effects that are really bad on the poor. And some of the NGOs want to help mitigate the effects of neoliberalism on uh, uh, the, extre the extreme poor. But, uh, right. this, but of course, no other, the main theater of events today, of course, is on the economic sphere. And that yeah. is the theater that is fully abandoned by most of the NGOs and the extent to which some of them in any way approach it, it's only as a, you know, again, a mitigating uh, 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 factor. And absolutely in lessening the effects on the you know on, on, of extreme poverty on certain absolutely countries. absolutely and in some ways we have reached a stage of this neoliberal project in which for, for them not to even pay lip service to this uh would would discredit them entirely because the levels of inequality that now we have we have reached uh, throughout the world uh you're absolutely right i mean i i think that uh, uh, some of these NGOs uh, certainly do have to uh, do work that does mitigate the suffering. And, and certainly the ones even that don't do it have to pay lip service to it because right, the, the stage that we've reached has utterly exposed uh, the, the, the neoliberal project and the, the mass impoverishment that it's caused. But we can go on, on this topic for a while, but I think, I think we've made uh, the, the main point. I want to say just one, yes. one after thought. Sure. The important thing, of course, uh, again, 
is the question of, hu of, of human rights. So yes. human rights, of course, the definition that is adopted by all these Western-supported NGOs is the yeah. US definition of human rights, meaning economic rights are not human rights. So right. while, so the right to free health care, the right to free education, the right to housing, the right to work are not considered human rights because the US does not consider them such, whereas previously right. the Soviets and third world welfare states always did. However, um, uh, not being able to express a political opinion becomes a human right rather than a civil right or a political right. right. So it is important that, so all the talk about human rights usually do not include these basic economic human rights that are not included. They're called them separately as social and economic rights that are not really within the purview of organizations like Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch, who right. would, for example, write a report on India for not providing 100% uh, healthcare to all its population, a free right. health or free, that would not be a violation of human rights, let alone, of course, the US. But which does not provide, you know, a health, a free health care to uh, its population. So again, um, even those issues are very much exactly the neoliberal agenda. But we can absolutely no, no. It's 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 actually a good segue because I was thinking when you're talking, uh, when we it's it's important we brought up this whole issue of how the in some ways the the human rights industry in the West, uh, the way that it has. Uh, very narrowly defined what 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 human rights are and and what are kind of irrelevant to the whole uh domain of human rights uh it, it a segue to kind of what we wanted to discuss around the issue of the resurgence of islamophobia and what it made me think of of course is the long uh genealogy and lineage of this uh colonial uh, type of uh, colonial feminism, colonial uh, all types of uh, uh, projects to to civilize, to uh, liberate, um, and particularly here we're talking about in in Islamic contexts. So I, I I wanted to kind of uh, transition from that from what you said at the at the end about talking about kind of this narrowing of a notion of uh, human rights uh, and the way that now we enter this period. In which, of course, the most uh, uh, immediate example right after 9-11 was, of course, the war in Afghanistan, because um, mm -hmm. most of the feminist groups within the United States clearly on board the, the project uh, to liberate the women of Afghanistan uh, from these uh, uh, barbaric uh, uh, Muslim men. And so and, and that has a long uh, history going back colonial to colonial feminism. And I wanted to perhaps begin the discussion of Islamophobia uh, by, 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 this, uh, by this whole, the, the history of that. I, I think this is a good segue, especially as one of the issues about human rights that are basically articulated in by US and West European liberalism is that these culturalist conceptions of rights, of European rights, are universalized, are thought of as applicable around right. the world, uh, as opposed to a specific kind of European Protestant or secular, which is one and the same, uh, type of culture that produced them. Right? So as a result, whatever the West produces has universal applicability. Any kind of value system that you might have within your own uh, uh, country and history becomes cultural. So whatever they do is not cultural, it's universal. Whatever anybody right. else who is not part of the non-white, non-European, non, -white, non Protestant world does is a cultural manifestation. So uh, this is, of course, how we begin to see this discourse from the 18th century. The idea that suddenly a Western kind of uh, tyranny and despotism is considered enlightened and that the problem with Western tyrants and despots at the time, we see this in the work of um, the French uh, 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 thinker uh, Montesquieu, who tells or assails actually uh, French kings and European kings who are too absolutist that they are acting the way Oriental despots and Muslim despots do. Right. So in a way he's shaming them into not being Oriental. So the project at the time of the 18th century was very much to make sure Europe is Occidentalized, it's Westernized, right. and any traces of this alleged Orient that exists within it is eliminated. Right. We see this also 
by the end of the 18th century by the uh, British uh, uh, women's rights uh, uh, thinker, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, who would also yes. advance the idea of assailing European men for the way they treat their women, telling them that they treat them the way Muslims and Orientals treat right. them. Um, so again, it's shaming them into telling them you are better than these people. And of course, all based on all kinds of Orientalist fantasies of how Muslim men and Muslim women live and not to mention, you know, the, 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 sta the, the, the uh, standing in the law, etc. So this begins, of course, uh, uh, the idea from the 19th century of uh, uh, colonial feminism, um, although uh, there are some brackets on it sort of by the late 19th century because of the Victorian era, where the problem became, begins to be uh, seen as the debauchery of Muslim men and, and Muslim women uh, who do not seem to abide by the more strict um, sexual values of the Victorian period. As we know, by the 1950s and 60s, as the so-called sexual revolution takes place in Europe, we're told then that Muslims are actually very uh, repressed sexually. Right. As before, right. we were told they were debauched and open compared to a repressive Europe. Now they become very repressive compared to a liberated um, Europe. But yes, so for example, many of the colonial officials in the 19th century who would support the rights of women, say, um, uh, in Egypt, uh, Lord Cromer, the, the uh, basically the British viceroy who ran Egypt, opposed women's suffrage in Britain, but uh, spearheaded the campaign of so-called unveiling of, yes. of urban upper-class Egyptian women. As you might know, the majority of peasant women in Egypt did not right. feel at all. It was a class right. issue for right. uh, both Muslim and Christian Egyptian women. Nonetheless, so you see, you see this kind of colonial feminism of uh, a way to control uh, many of these countries and transform their cultures. We see how France began to do this in trying to create a new kind of Islam in Algeria, um, mm -hmm. as the British were trying to do the same in India. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so that the idea of even uh, uh, religious reform, which begins in the middle of the 19th century, would get a lot of support from uh, these colonial powers, uh, because the idea was at the time that Islam should be transformed into something akin to Protestant Christianity. Right. That these new reform movements, especially by Al-Afghani and Muhammad Abdul, uh, uh, in the case of the Arab world uh, uh, and Iran in the second half of the 19th century, uh, um, were very much supported by British colonial uh, officials. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, in that sense, uh, were very much in line with British policy uh, at the time. So, um, as so, we should not confuse sort of you know the the, the colonial Orientalism, which begins in the late 18th century, uh, mostly an anti-Ottoman uh, idea. Although, of course, um, you know the colonial powers were now in possession of vast lands uh, where majority yes. of the populations lived. You have the Dutch who have taken over the East Indies or what becomes Indonesia. The English were everywhere now across the Indian subcontinent. Um, uh, and uh, the French were in Algeria and extending themselves across the rest of North Africa. The Italians yeah. were newcomers in the 20th century to Libya and Eritrea, uh, but they were less significant in that sense. Um, so as a result, having these huge uh, Muslim populations, they were very concerned about Ottoman power and that the Ottoman Sultan, uh, increasingly seeing himself and presenting himself as a caliph, could easily uh, foment revolution against yes. uh, Christian uh, colonial rule in these places. So um, the attempt to take over the Ottoman Empire from you know, the 19th century on and subsequently dismantling it by World War I was very yes. much part of keeping the colonial Muslim uh, territory yes. quiescent and of course to divide the loot between them um, right. as well as, as had happened. Um, in uh, the French, of course, in Algeria, as soon as they arrived, began, of course, to take over mosques and tra they transformed the major mosque in Algiers into the Cathedral de Saint-Philippe uh, uh, in two years of their uh, uh, conquest of Algeria, as they would do with many other uh, sort of mm -hmm. mosques. Uh, which were transformed into churches. Um, uh, the idea, again, is that uh, uh, both for the Protestants and the Catholics, although, although more for the Protestants, mm. that mm. 
old religion, and at least you know Protestant Christianity now would be the youngest religion, and therefore the mm -hmm. most advanced. Um, the French Catholics felt that also, uh, uh, while while not Protestant, uh, that uh, their religion was still more civilized than all other, of course, religions, Judaism, right. not, not to mention non-monotheistic uh, religions. So um, in, in large measure then, uh, uh, the question of what becomes Islamophobia has yes. roots, of course, in Orientalism. However, things would change, of course, after the end of colonialism, um, hmm. uh, especially after World War II. Remember, many of the Muslim populations of the colonies were brought in to fight Europe, Europe's wars during World War yes. I. Yes. And, and right. also as cheap labor. So, for example, you know, uh, tens of thousands of Algerians would come to France during World War I or even before as cheap labor and would settle there. So today, French yes. racists, when they speak about French Muslims as if they're immigrants or guests, forget that most yes. of them have been there for, you know, for, for probably 100 years, right? Exactly. Uh, gone there before World War I and certainly are a lot more French than someone like, say, uh, Sarkozy, who's of Hungarian and Greek origins, who is found right. way before many of the Muslim Algerians or North African uh, populations. Um, so uh, uh, similarly, uh, you know, we, we, we see this in other places, whether it's Turks in Germany, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Indians, Pakistanis and Bangladesh yes. in Britain, in England, in, yeah. Indonesians in uh, uh, Holland. Um, so uh, again, these populations have, were brought in to serve these elites at that time. Um, the concern after the 1960s was that their populations was, uh, were, were increasing. Um, the white uh, populations of Western Europe were decreasing as a, you know, and, and the median age was getting higher and higher. Um, and suddenly uh, uh, the concern began to be hugely important after the Iranian revolution. The idea, mm -hmm. the idea that uh, a new form of Islam. At the time, they were concerned, but uh, they were concerned about the more conservative Sunni regimes uh, who right. thought could be threatened by uh, the Iranian Islamic revolution uh, in the right. late 1970s. So you begin to see this discourse about Islam and terrorism, Islam and conservatism. The issue of the veil is again brought up again after, yes. uh, uh, you know, about... Uh, 60 or 50 years of less attention to it. Uh, and again, of course, the, the, the question of the veil, even in Algeria, as we know, was the anxiety by the French that they could be seen by Muslim women without right. being able to see them. The idea that they have to be exposed and be visible to white colonial soldiers was very, very important. Mm -hmm. uh, and usually the system of surveillance that the West has put uh, uh, since the beginning of the Enlightenment, what the uh, philosopher French, uh, the French philosopher Michel Foucault talks about, uh, this attempt at a panoptical view of the world, of surveilling the world, right. becomes, of course, important that only uh, um, the European powers and the European bourgeoisie should not be made visible in its exploitative uh, practices. But all its potential victims and actual victims must be exposed, yes. and unveiled, yes. so they can be surveilled. So there's a multiple sort of layers to the question of uh, 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 you know, sort of the, the idea of, of, of uh, Islam as the enemy and Islamophobia. The situation yeah. becomes worse after 9-11. Okay. Yeah. And suddenly, yeah. And in fact, I wanted to, I wanted you, I mean, when you were speaking earlier about uh, the, during the Cold War and all of the type of propaganda uh, stuff that was material uh, propagated throughout the world, and in some ways, in the post 9-11 world, we have seen a similar phenomena sitting here in Pakistan and all over th throughout the Muslim world. We have seen, uh, you know, these Muslim outreach programs under various administrations. You know, and uh, we often joke about, you know, this, uh, the, well, the United States is a deeply kind of a very uh, principled, you know, secular society, doesn't want to try to establish any type of religion, separation. With, spending billions of dollars trying to create a type of Islam. Uh, you know, what is that, you know? So, so in some ways... But not only that, exactly the, that. the U.S. is yeah. one of the most religious societies, right? Over 90% yeah. yeah. of Americans belong to Christian denominations. Right. Uh, and so in that sense, 
Uh, unlike Western Europe, which is less religious on average, yeah. the Americans have always been the most religious of industrialized societies. Yep. Of course, if, if, you, if you have the British being interested in producing a liberal Islam along with the French in the late 19th century through the 1940s, you begin to see also the British and the Americans beginning to be interested in creating a jihadist Islam in the 1950s right. to fight communism. So, That's right. And to find to, to fight third world socialist anti colonialism, whether in Indonesia, whether in Afghanistan, but also in the Soviet Union. Remember, uh, a lot of this was, there was a huge campaign against uh, the Soviet Union that it allegedly oppressed uh, Soviet Muslims um, and that Muslims should not support uh, the Soviet Union in that sense uh, and should condemn it. Um, and therefore, the support for jihadist groups against yes. communism. Uh, in the Soviet Union and elsewhere would begin in earnest in the 1950s. Oh, yes. And we see the end of that, or not really the end, uh, the, the Afghanistan situation would also spill over into Syria after 2011. Yes. Syria, which I call uh, Afghanistan part two. Yeah, Afghanistan part <laughs> two with basically yes. <laughs> even uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda supporters being funded right. by different American or French or uh, right. uh, uh, British outfits. So uh, that's one, one project. And, 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 yeah. a, and a parallel project is to produce a liberal Islam, the Islam right. of so-called human rights defined by the US, uh, reducing women's rights not to their economic rights as women's groups had fought for since World War I across the Third World and, 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 and other parts of the world, Eastern Europe uh, and the Soviet Union, but rather it became about uh, uh, women's uh, uh, ability to become entrepreneurs and uh, uh, getting sort of a, a, a small loans to have unproductive businesses that would not even get them out of the poverty in which they right. find themselves. So um, uh, the agenda of, of these rights changed, and the idea is that somehow Islam is opposed to women's rights, right? When, of course, right. uh, until women got some rights to inherit in, in, in Western Europe and in the US at the beginning of the 20th century, women and right. uh, women have always had that right uh, 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 before and after Islam, of course, which was, was guaranteed. Right. Um, and independence, financial independence, where husbands don't have you know, legal right to intervene in, in their wives' uh, finances. In any case, so you basically, uh, you're absolutely right. This, is, this begins to be the new pattern. So you have two projects. One, right. create a Protestant life Islam acceptable European and American white uh, uh, left liberals, and on the other hand, a yeah. jihadist Islam that is condemned as the obscurantist, but is necessary to bring down regimes that we hate, like the Syrian right. regime, like the Afghan previous regime, etc. So, yeah. No, I, 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 absolutely. And and just to end that this part of it, uh, uh, Professor Masad, the. The whole issue of Islamophobia in, in that sense, and particularly has, as it has uh, unfolded, obviously, throughout the war on terror, although now we're, uh, like, as we've been discussing, by the end of it, uh, by the end of this ongoing permanent war, the past uh, few years, we have, uh, the past several years, because we have once again needed that jihadi Islam, <laughs> and that so we then uh, support these folks from from Libya to Syria and so on and so forth. And now all of a sudden, terrorism and the war on terror is not even part of the national security defense documents. It's now great power rival rivalry: China, Russia, and the war on terror. Whatever happened to that? We don't know. Uh, no, but so, but I remember this blowback from this because these yeah. when when France made it possible for some of yep. the poor uh, French Muslims to join the Syrian jihadists and head yes. which it was funding in different kinds of ways. When they came back, they are the ones who would commit certain kinds of terrorist, terrorist acts for which the entire Muslim community is blamed right. for innocent and the only guilty party besides the people who commit these acts is the French government, of course. Right, right. And, um, and, and remember, during the alliance with the Saudis since the 1950s, when the Saudis were subcontracted by the US 
to fund religious education and to create a certain Saudi version of Islam to yes. educate Muslims around the world, it was these Saudis with their money who would send imams to actually teach Muslims in France and in Germany and in Holland what their Islam should be like. So the extent to which there's been any radicalization among young, poor, religious Muslims in France or in Germany, this was all yes. part of government policy since the 1950s and 60s to educate them in anti-communist, Wahhabist, Saudi Islam, and, and subsequently to help them also volunteer to join jihadist groups uh, uh, in Syria or in Libya. Absolutely. So, uh, and, this, and, is the, uh, this, the, this is the question that no one asks, that these guys were so easily able to go, to go and facilitate it to go to Syria, to these places to fight. And then when they come back and then we kind of ask, where did these people come from and so on? And, 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 and you're absolutely right. It's not just this, it's, it's, it's part of a long standing government policy of allowing basically that relationship with the, the Saudi Wahhabi state and for them to kind of uh, send their uh, trained, uh, trained imams to basically uh, brainwash the entire uh, Muslim world. And it's not just obviously within uh, France or, or, or in, in the uh, Muslim minority context, but even Muslim majority context, places like Pakistan, places like, uh, you know, Indonesia, well, other places. Like Pakistan or like, like, like uh, uh, Egypt or elsewhere, yes. the Saudis also would do is, of course, they would donate huge amounts of textbooks about Islam. To be yes. with the school children, and since Pakistan and Egypt are not big rich states, they would yes. accept donations of the sort that now would become the basis of this new kind of education, right? So, Absolutely. So in that sense, it was not just a matter of sending imams and mosques, but actually yep. printing, printing, you know, millions of books about Islam that are distributed for free across yes. populations that could not afford to buy these books otherwise. And then, of course, uh, 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 training these people. But remember, sort of what happened in France recently is also take two. We've already seen this in the 1980s with returnees from Afghanistan yeah. who began to attack right. the Saudi state or the Egyptian state. And right. we were told now that Islamists you know, are responsible. But these are the kind of jihadists that were supported and funded by the US and the Saudis uh, and even Mubarak's Egypt. Uh, or even Sadatist Egypt, uh, uh, before Sadat was actually uh, assassinated by one of them um, uh, at that time. So again, the idea that the, the, the returnees from America's right. wars against its enemies, or the West's wars against its enemies, now began to be an important part of Islamophobia. That on the one right. hand, you support jihadism, on the other hand, you support... Absolutely. Absolutely. Professor Mossad, but... Um this, um, uh, however important these uh, specific uh, policies that have that the uh, these Western plutocratic governments have engaged in that have uh, uh, produced this blowback. Uh, beyond that, is there a larger uh, uh, larger sense that you have of of the function of Islamophobia uh, or the relationship of the uh, quote unquote West with Islam? that drives a certain form of Islamophobia today. Is there something bigger than that, than what we're speaking about in terms of just uh, these policies that have certainly produced the type of blowback we spoke about? Well, I think, I think neoliberalism uh, is the story. Uh, yeah. uh, one of the few uh, ongoing uh, peoples around the world with ideologies or religious understandings of the world that has stood as resistance to the spread of neoliberalism and liberal universalizing ideas mm -hmm. to make it possible has been the Muslim world and partly Africa. So Africa, several African countries, and uh, most, uh, and, and sometimes of course there's African Muslim countries as well, as well as most of the Muslim world, all together seem to be the last bastion of resistance to new mm -hmm. So uh, as a result, you yes. know, Iran becomes a problem. I mean, you begin to see some of that in Latin America, but this is more recent in terms of, because they, they usually use socialism. The rhetoric of socialism has been delegitimized in the West right. since the World War. They need to do very little effort to delegitimize it today. There's already an, a, you know, a, a red baiting anti-communism. Right. But for Islam and Africa, um, ultimately, the idea of human rights and liberal rights as uh, standing in the way of the universalizing.
of right. Europe's enlightened rights as opposed to universalizing Europe's and America's capital to be able to you know pillage more and more of these countries. And right. Iran stands in its way, becomes a problem. So Iran becomes a problem. Syria, which is strangely secular, but also becomes a problem. Uh, Hezbollah, which is a, a, an anti-colonial yes. resistance group in Lebanon, becomes a, 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 a problem, um, uh, etc. There are some remnants of the past, uh, North Korea or Venezuela, yes. uh, but the U.S. is able to take uh, you know, take care of some of those. Not successfully in Venezuela. Yes. Almost successfully uh, in, in in Ecuador, uh, uh, but but ultimately. Uh, uh, not so much. Uh, so, however, uh, there is an ongoing uh, ideological and intelligence, economic and military war against yes. these different groups because they continue to stand in the way of the advance of uh, US and West European uh, neoliberalism. It is not coincidental, for example, that the French are deployed in places in Niger or Mali, in areas where there are a lot of metals that uh, French uh, uh, corporations are invested. Yet exactly. they are concerned about Boko Haram. And in fact, right. whatever uh, uh, resistance they get is as a result of their intervention, right? right. And of right. the funding of these groups before. So, but it's all about economic exploitation. Uh, uh, right. Iran's oil remains very important, this, you know, Saudi oil, and not necessarily because Americans need that oil. They just need to control its distribution control it. to the rest yes. of yeah. Right, absolutely. And this is, uh, Professor Massad, uh, the, uh, a great way to kind of go to one of the other, the, the, the final kind of issue that we wanted to turn to, that was the current uh, predicament in, in the Inwana region, West Asia, North Africa, or the, the colonial term, the Middle East. Yeah. Uh, and because it, when we were speaking about uh, Iran, Hezbollah, Syria, uh, where's, uh, what's termed the axis of resistance often, the centrality of Israel in American foreign policy in the, in, 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 in the Middle East and the way that now it has been able to, of course, we know that these uh, ties have been building between the UAE and Saudi Arabia uh, and Israel for a while, the de facto, and now they're becoming de jure uh, in terms of the normalization, um, the, the so-called peace agreements between countries that were never at war with each other in the first place. So that's a, that's a joke in itself. But that, I do want you to, because this is something that you write really passionately about. Uh, and, uh, and yes, it's, uh, I think that it's, it is, as you say, the persistence of the Palestinian question is, I think today, uh, stands as a symbol of that ongoing anti-colonial uh, struggle for dignity and justice. So your thoughts on that, what's going on right now? Um, I think, of course, the Palestinians are an obstacle to making Iran the most important enemy and target for US and European, uh, West European intervention, as well, of course, as Israeli intervention. So if you can utilize the Palestinians, Iran, as we were speaking about earlier, can now be targeted uh, with impunity. The issue, of course, uh, with uh, the Gulf states begins after 9-11. As a result of a large number of Saudis who are involved in the 9-11 attacks, um, uh, the U.S. Congress and the U.S. media became exceedingly hostile to the Gulf oil families, the ruling families, especially the Saudis, but others as well. The Saudis, the Qataris, and the UAE became very, very concerned about this bad press they were getting and realized after 9-11 that the only way back into getting less hostile and hopefully more friendly American media yeah. and less hostile attacks in Congress would be to cozy up to the pro-Israel U.S. lobby. Right. Uh, so this became the way to try to uh, reduce the amount of hostility, both popular media and congressional, against the Gulf regimes because, of the, because they were seen as complicit or at least having aided or having been the yes. place who originated the hijackers and the attackers of 9-11. Um, so um, a lot of money you begin to see very, very quickly all kinds of uh, sub rosa kind of relationships between Qatar on the one hand and Saudi Arabia on the one hand and the UAE on the one hand and Israel. But they were not very quick. In the case of the UAE, uh, in 2000, 
Six, one of its major uh, companies, a Dubai port company, that had yes. won this big uh, uh, contract to administer, I think, six to ten American ports. Ultimately, right. lost it after it was approved by uh, 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 the U.S. government as a result of a major pro-Israel lobbyists and congressmen who campaigned against the Dubai company that it, it becoming in charge of American ports is a national security threat. So right. they ultimately lost the deal. The UAE realized that it had to redouble its efforts to cozy up the, right. Israel, and the Israel lobby, which it immediately did so much so that by 2018, it began to get all kinds of new deals. Its companies began to get new deals at American ports without uh, uh, voices of the Israel lobby being raised. Indeed, the very same company that the U.S. lobby, the, that the, the pro-Israel U.S. lobby prevented from executing the deal it had signed back in 2006, has recently signed a new deal with the Israeli port authorities in Haifa. Right. So, right. Um, <laughs> as result, so as a result, you begin to see um, yeah. that uh, uh, the, these governments understood that the way back into uh, mm -hmm. the heart of the American media and Congress and a popular discourse is through cozying up to Israel, with whom they now shared uh, uh, sort of also uh, uh, Iran as an enemy. And uh, the Palestinians had ceased to be of any importance uh, some time ago. Uh, remember, support for the Palestinians by these regimes back in the 1970s was not ideological, but right. political. They supported the PLO in, or in order to de-radicalize it. Uh, they supported uh, Yasser mm -hmm. Arab. Fatah movement, which was the least radical, and the hope was it would become less radical. Um, Palestinian revolutionary groups at the time had supported uh, many of the uh, revolutionary Arab groups against these regimes. Revolutionary right. groups fighting in Oman, fighting in Bahrain, student groups, workers groups in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere, in Yemen. Uh, yes. In Morocco, uh, a lot of these conservative Arab regimes uh, supported and funded the PLO uh, on condition that the PLO no longer support their own uh, uh, revolutionary groups that sought right. to grow them. Um, by the 1980s, uh, by 1982, the PLO is defeated in a major Israeli invasion of Lebanon supported by the U.S. So its military might was uh, uh, suddenly uh, reduced considerably, and it was expelled from Lebanon. Its new headquarters would be hundreds of miles away from Palestine in Tunisia. Uh, yes. Around that time, of course, increasingly, uh, uh, the revolutionary groups across the Gulf had died down or were defeated by repressive measures. Um, with, you know, at the time, the Shah of Iran was a major ally of these uh, countries, uh, of, the, of these oil um, yes. ruling uh, groups, and he helped bring his army to subdue their revolutionary opposition. So by... Uh, finally, by the late 1980s, uh, the Soviet Union was disappearing, uh, which meant the diplomatic uh, support for the Palestinian struggle was gone uh, with the disappearance of the socialist camp. Around the same time, of course, Iraq invades Kuwait. The PLO and Jordan refused to support the uh, coalition invasion of the Gulf and wanted to resolve the issue internally inside the Arab world. This was taken to mean that they supported Saddam rather than Kuwait. And all funding, all funding for the PLO was stopped. So the PLO right. now was no longer needed. It was no longer a threat that could support revolutionary groups that could unseat these ruling groups. There was no diplomatic international support for the Palestinians after the Soviets and the socialist camp uh, had disappeared. And the transformation of most of the third world intellectual and political elites into liberals and neoliberals. So as a right. result, there was no reason to support the Palestinians and alienate Israel when Israel could harm their interests in the U.S. so brilliantly well. So as a result, they decided Iran is the real threat to their regime. Israel shares that enmity. And uh, the best thing of how to proceed is to actually completely neutralize the Palestinian struggle, support Israel, normalize it, um, and uh, continue the war against Iran in alliance with the U.S. and Western Europe. Absolutely. Two uh, final questions, and um, as briefly as you can.
Professor Mossad, even though uh, they are pretty, <laughs> um, uh, pretty central questions in, in, in terms of uh, understanding uh, the dynamics uh, taking place around Israel and the Middle East. One is, of course, the old, the well, I mean, the not, not so old, but the debate around the United States and its relationship with Israel. Uh, what, what what determines that uh, the, the closeness of that relationship? Is it the old uh, Chomsky position that Israel is a strategic asset for uh, the United States in the Middle East? Or is there another, the other point of view, uh, uh, Walt Marsheimer, uh, that, that in fact the, the Israeli lobby, the Israeli lobby even defined broadly within the United States, uh, has exerts such enormous uh, um, influence on American foreign policy, or is there another third theory presented by Professor Joseph Massad that explains this? No, no. I mean, I, I listen. First of all, you have to remember uh, Israel as a European colonial settler state shares yes. that colonial settler history with the white supremacist U.S. settler colony. So there is right. that kind of a shared history. Um, yes, they both have a religious ideology to justify also much of the settler colonialism, including their expansion, manifest destiny, and what have you. Uh, the uh, yes. of the promised land. So that's one important, of course, issue. Uh, now, uh, the the theory that the pro-Israel lobby is is uh, enormously powerful is not wrong. It is powerful, but it is powerful because it serves U.S. interests, not because of anything. Right. Uh, remember, um, uh, in the 1950s, you had the China lobby, what was called the China lobby, which uh, made sure that the U.S. would not recognize the People's Republic of China until 1972. Remember, the People's right. Republic seat at the U.N. could not be occupied because of opposition by the U.S. Taiwan occupied it. Uh, right. because, and the China lobby at the time was very strong because it pushed for U.S. interests. It's not that they, it didn't oppose U.S. interests, so it supported right. U.S. policy and even wanted the U.S. to intensify. it. By the 1960s, you have the Cuba lobby, which also, right. like the U.S. government, uh, was yes. opposed to the Cuban Revolution. And right. supported more, and it became very enormously strong, and continues yes. to, and pushed for more uh, aggressive policy toward Cuba. The Israel law, which emerges in the 1970s, is no stronger. I mean, the extent to which it is stronger than the China lobby or the Cuba lobby is because Israel is a more important U.S. strategy in the Middle East. Mm. So. Mm -hmm. um, People who think there's something special about that, uh, uh, that without absent Israel, the U.S. would have supported the Palestinian struggle, are sorely mistaken. The U.S., of course, mm. as you know, has never supported the national liberation struggle right. of the Third World uh, since uh, uh, World War II at all. Uh, right. so why would the Palestinians uh, be the exception absent the pro-Israel struggle? The Americans right. that support the struggle of the Vietnamese or of the Cambodians or of the South Africans or of the Algerians, why would they have supported the Palestinians? So while right. the Israel lobby, of course, wants Israel, American hostility to Palestinians and friendship and alliance with Israel to continue to intensify, it is not the cause of that strategy. Right. It simply pushes for more of the same. So, yeah, precisely. So it is in sync. The Israeli lobby is in sync with the U.S. interest itself within the Middle East. Uh, I think that's, that's the way we can look at it. If it was not in sync with those interests, it would not be as... Yeah, Indeed, yeah, yeah, yeah. the Soviet Union would have funded a major lobby to change American policy to support the Precisely. Soviet Union. Precisely. Right, right, right. If the Soviets could change American policy, then the Soviets could have done that. No. Lobbies Absolutely. in America, lobbies in the U.S., political lobbies on foreign policy are successful because they push existing policy. They, want, right. they just want it to go even further. That's all. They don't oppose existing policy. Right. This is a crucial point. This is a crucial point because many Muslims, Arabs, etc., fall into this trap of thinking that well, it's just about uh, 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 you know getting the power, and then we can change our uh, existing U.S. foreign policy for decades. We can no, change no, it, but no amount of Iranian money can buy a pro-Iranian <laughs> lobby in the U.S. Right. to change U.S. policy. Brilliant. Yeah. No, that's exactly what I wanted. And the final question is a very selfish question for us here in Pakistan right now, but it, again, it, it's very much related to what's going on, and that is this uh, so-called normalization process uh, with Israel, recognizing Israel that is now 
come from the UAE, Bahrain. We expect Saudi to follow soon, and uh, the, the Sudanese have been pressured to do it. And uh, the Pakistanis are, are, are being pressured. I mean, something unthinkable, absolutely unthinkable, and it's still unthinkable to a hundred and two percent of the population of the country. Uh, but but the, but the, the so uh, just uh, I mean, I, it's almost silly that I'm asking you this question. Why should Pakistan not normalize relations with Israel? Well, I mean, uh, I remember, I mean, the Sudanese, for example, were given uh, uh, an important bribe that they would be taken off the U.S. list of terrorist countries if they recognize Israel. And of course, the recognition of Israel, yet again, I mean, because of how strongly connected Israeli policy is with U.S. imperial designs in the region, in fact, globally, remember, Israel has served U.S. imperial designs globally in Central America and Southern Africa. Yes. Not only really in the Arab and Muslim world, you know, it was the, 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 the Israelis were the biggest allies of apartheid South Africa, of the Central uh, American dictatorships Absolutely. in the 70s and 80s. And when the U.S. could not send arms to these dictatorships, it would somehow yes. Israel produce them. So in that sense, uh, 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 the Sudanese are not enamored of the Israelis. They are enamored yes. of gaining, again, a position in international politics and trade and sort of on the diplomatic circles that would reintegrate them in the international system. And the U.S. tells them the price is for you to normalize with Israel because that idea would be important in the war against the genocidal Saudi war against Yemen and you know, hopefully a similar one that they would like to do against Iran. Pakistan mm -hmm. is a country that is adjacent to Iran and to uh, Afghanistan historically. As you know, yes. uh, Pakistan had been subcontracted during the Afghani war by the U.S. Yes. time. Uh, clearly, the hope is that it could be subcontracted yet again uh, for yes. a possible war on Iran. Now, um, what are the benefits for the Pakistani people from uh, uh, an alliance with Israel or normalization with Israel? It remains unclear. I mean, clearly the Israelis would benefit greatly diplomatically and economically by finding a new market to dump their substandard products on. But nonetheless, <laughs> and of course, uh, some of the Pakistan neoliberal capitalist elites might find it also uh, very uh, uh, civilized and European-like to be friend. Oh, yes. In, in our English language media, you have this. Uh, people. What's I wrong with it? Some yeah. of it? When I visited and spoke in Pakistan in Karachi a couple of years ago, when I spoke with some people. So there was that kind of a liberal, you know, uh, white wannabe, uh, we are civilized too, and why shouldn't we speak right. to the civilized? Which you get through from you know white wannabe liberals across the third world as we began right. the conversation uh, because of the neoliberal economic interests and the so-called universal liberal values of white liberals in the US. Um, and the West. So um, uh, in that sense, of course, I think uh, 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 the benefits are clear. There are Israeli benefits to the detriment of the yes. majority of the people of Pakistan. So I, uh, the people of Pakistan have been struggling economically and they don't, yes. need, they don't need more uh, uh, economic uh, oppression and exploitation uh, in uh, the civilized world and befriending the country of Israel. Right. And of course, as you may know, the Prime Minister Imran Khan has spoken uh, very forcefully about the Kashmiri struggle, uh, which is also under a very brutal military occupation right now. And you see yeah. it adopting the just the Israeli playbook of now settler colonialism, bringing in Indian settlers into Kashmir. Uh, and of course, he has made statements on the Palestinian. So th there's clearly a, a moral impulse there as well, recognizing that... Uh, this is a, a this is part of that anti-colonial tradition against uh, settler colonialism against uh, military occupation. So I'm sure that uh, that that is part of uh, 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 your your. Um, yeah, you know, yeah, argument yeah. As well. I mean, the ideological question, of course, is a, and the moral question is, is is a very important one. But in the world of realpolitik, of course, it's uh, the kinds of rewards, political and economic rewards, that the Pakistani elite. Yeah hope to get those who support this kind of normalization among Pakistani right. hope to get. Um, I think the more, uh, uh, the more sober analysis of the other part of the Pakistani elite who doesn't see a benefit, but perhaps yeah. a, a, a lack of benefit, maybe even a loss 
and undertake yes. a, a step, uh, I think, are in the right, even from a, not right. from a theological, but from a, a, you know, a kind of a sober analysis of the situation. That is not absolutely, ideal. absolutely, and it's it's very um, actually astute of you to observe that, and this is what it seems like to us as well. This this is a real division of of those who are stuck to the old uh, way, the old Cold, Cold War framework, and uh, the the Pakistani military basically almost being a mercenary army defending these conservative Gulf Arab regimes, etc. And the new that's recognizing that uh, the, the world is, is reorienting. Uh, it's a new geopolitics of the world. And there are countries uh, like, like Iran, Turkey, Malaysia, others that could potentially within the, uh, at least within the Islamic state world, could counter that hegemony that the Saudis have historically exerted uh, throughout uh, the Islamic state world. Remember, the Shah's army played that role before. Uh, uh, Pakistan, the Jordanian army helped, for example, in Oman yes. to, to bring down the revolution back in the early set to mid 70s, etc. So, yes, of course. And uh, in that sense, Pakistan was also a bulwark of anti Soviet policy during the Cold War. Absolutely. So, uh, the idea is to bring it into another sort of regional hot war, if not Cold War, with right. uh, Iran and Afghanistan um, is not something that is, uh, should be of interest to uh, no. the majority of the struggling masses in Pakistan. I don't know. Wonderful. Professor Massad, I've taken more time than I than, than we said, so I'd like to profusely apologize for that. But uh, I just uh, could not help uh, pick your brain on, on these issues. I am most grateful to be uh, on your program, and I look forward to uh, hopefully coming in person uh, yet again to visit Pakistan. Yes, and, and yes. And hopefully for a, a, a different experience and a different crowd with a different narrative. <laughs> um, I, I, I had a wonderful time when I visited uh, Pakistan last time. The, 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 wonderful. Uh, a beautiful country. The, the, uh, I was, uh, the hospitality was amazing, but also getting to be in that part of the world that I had read so much yes. and not having been there to... Uh, be inside it was just an amazing, you know, an, an, an important experience. And, and, that, that, and that was in Karachi, correct? I was in Karachi. I was in Karachi, uh, uh, okay. which, you know, I, I, I love. Yes. And of course, yes. uh, I know I will also love, you know, uh, yes. uh, uh, <laughs> cities uh, from Lahore to Islamabad uh, 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 across the country. So I Not exactly um, possible. No, we very much look forward to that. And Professor Massad, once again, I want to thank uh, thank you, remind our viewership that we have just uh, had uh, more than an hour with one of the leading thinkers in the world today. Uh, Professor Joseph Massad, professor at Columbia University, follow his articles, his works, his books, and uh, we hope to really have him on the program maybe once again. And, and certainly here in Pakistan, you know, once conditions are good enough to have him here uh, and, and uh, give his profound insights and erudition uh, uh, to us once more. So thank you, Professor Massad, for joining us today. Thank you.